asked for a star in my design and what did I get? A squiggle. Hello and welcome back to The Tea with Crema. My name is Chris. I'll be your host today and I'm joined by my best friend, Emma. Hello, everyone. Today's episode is an extra special episode brought to you by the randomness of our brains. <laughs> so something that we're always talking about without even talking about is our love languages. And so we wanted to actually take some time to go over our love languages. I know what Emma's top love language is because it's, again, something that we've talked about before. Um, but, you know, there are five love languages and they certainly can fit on the whole spectrum continuum, however you want to describe it. And so we want to go over that. And then I think what's super exciting about it is I still have like my love language results from when I took it back in 2019. And so it'll be actually kind of interesting to look and see how my love language has changed over time. Because out loud, I was like, no, no, they're definitely probably like the same. And then the results kind of surprised me a little bit. And then in addition to that, we have our apology languages. And so before we dive into both of those things, we do want to still do our tea checks. So Emma, what tea did you bring today? Today, I brought a peach and passion fruit. I've drank it many times on the show, but again, it's a very big box. I'm making my way through it. What are you drinking today? Today, I have the Sugar Cookie Sweetheart by Cookie Tea Co. Oh. And it is a caffeine-free tea, and it says it's steeped with love. And you can kind of tell because all of the shapes and the white cocoa splits and the caro bits are all heart shapes. So it's actually very, very sweet. It's pretty chill overall. You know how I feel about chocolate teas and dessert teas. And so this one was, it was okay. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't bad. So I'd give it a three out of five stars for sure. Oh, nice. That's still pretty safe. It's not the worst, but it's not the best. I like it. Shall we get into it? What's your language? Tell me your language. Tell me what's your flavor. My top language has stayed the same from 2019 to now. And it is still quality time. It just is. It just is that it has been that and it is still that. You know what's funny is because when I took it in 2019, I think we took it at the same time because of, are you looking at it from when we took it for TFA? It's possible. So I think when we first, like in our second year in the core, we ended up having to take the test. And when I took it, mine was actually quality time as well. So what is it now? Gifts. But I will say that my quality time was at an eight (laughs) and my gifts was at a seven. Now oh. it's that it's like it's like pretty still pretty similar. They're very like it's flipped, but definitely like physical touch has always been my last. And I think isn't that the same for you too? Physical touch is not your false physical touch was number two. Really? What about now? Now it's number three. Oh, as I've gotten older and more tired, acts of service has moved up from four because I used to be very independent. I'll do it myself. I don't need nobody. So now it's number two because. Oh, you want to do it? Okay. <laughs> we'll we make will it make work. it work. Actually, okay. So like in order, what are yours? Sorry, I cut you off before. Originally, it was quality time, physical touch, words of affirmation, acts of service, and gifts. Now, presently, it is quality time, acts of service, physical touch, gifts, words of affirmation. Oh, interesting. Now, in all fairness, when I took it the first time, those last three were very much the last three. Ah, uh, like it was a clear last three. It was very clearly a last three. So, like, access services made a pretty significant jump from four to two. And words has taken a bit of a dive for me. Because for me, same thing. My Well, like, my top four were very close to each other, but it was clearly that, like, physical touch. I'm not about that life for whatever reason. Back in the day, it was quality time, receiving gifts, words of affirmation, acts of service. Now, the only really big, I feel like everything's kind of moved up one and then quality time just went to second because now in 2023, it's receiving gifts, quality time, acts of service, words of affirmation, and touches like clearly like it's 0% on the, you know, the wheel when it gives you and this test that we took, it gives you like percentages. But before it was like a ranking system, I think. And it was like eight, seven, seven, six, two. No, now it's like the four and then zero <laughs> percent. Now you've just become affirmed in like 
it's not for me. I'm not about that life. And I wonder why, though, sometimes, though, I think about it. And I'm like, I think I'm a very affectionate person. But I don't think that I need to touch you to let you know that like, oh, this is like, I don't equate touch with like, this is how much I love you. I get it. That makes sense. I just am comforted by hugs. The act of being wrapped tightly in something (laughs) has always been comforting to me. A straight jacket. (laughs) A swaddle. (laughs) A, A nice, a nice swaddle. Is something that's always really comforting. So that makes sense why it would be up there. And then I've already explained why acts of service moved up. I'm just less prideful now. I used to be of the mindset that I was the only person who could do anything for me the right way. <laughs> I still believe that, but I'm willing to work with you. <laughs> we can work together to figure out what's going to be the best way to service me. <laughs> because ultimately, I just can't do it all. I'm just, I can't do it all. One of those questions even exemplified it. It was just like, it, one of the options was, man, someone did something for me when I was just too tired to do it myself. And I was like, yes, yes, yes. yes. that is acts of service because yes. Being emotionally mature enough to understand like, okay, I need to step up to the plate, so I'm going to do it. And then having someone do that for you. Wow. There's nothing better than that. Like Isaac's number one is acts of service, which is what I've like, as now as an adult, you know, like that is how I show my love to him. And mine has always been like topless gifts. And it's not even the material part. It's you were thinking about me and this made you think of me. And so he's still kind of hesitant because he thinks that when I like, when I want gifts, he's like, oh, like I I just think in my head, like, is she going to think this is dumb? Is she going to think like, is she even going to like this? And I'm like, it's not even that. It's the act of you finding something that you think I would need and attempting to like, give me that in that regard like this past year we did for christmas we did four gifts and it was something that you want something that you need something that is i think it was something to like wear and then something borrowed shoot, I don't know. it was you know along those <laughs> lines and i had been talking or and he had seen and i'll take a picture of it too he had seen that i was using a shoe like shoe boxes as my laptops as my laptop scan stand and so he's like i was so tired of seeing that shoe box (laughs) so he got me like a proper laptop stand like i i knew it was on my to-do list it just wasn't a high priority but after i got it i was like wow this frees up so much space on my desk (laughs) so that was a need that was definitely the need category yeah it was definitely a need but you know like i think that as you get older right you prioritize things differently but I do think that it's funny that I went from, I think the quality time and receiving gifts just like flipping. I do enjoy quality time though. I think that's always going to be like a top. It is my top one because ultimately I just like time is the most valuable resource thing that we have. That's true, right? Like, and if someone is willing to spend their time with me, it just speaks so highly to what they think of me, in my opinion. It's also why I can't stand people who flake in the last minute. It's oh, I'd be ready to fight. <laughs> and I don't even fight, but I'd be ready. So a lesser known quiz from the same people is the apology language. So I don't know, had you taken the apology language quiz ever before? No, this was my, I didn't even realize that they had extra quizzes. And I feel like you and I kind of just like really like these personality quizzes anyway. Like that's kind of just like, hey, have you taken this one? Have you taken this one? So I had never heard of the apology language before, but you, have you taken it before? I have, but I will say, because even when you took it and you read your results, they are different. Then when I took it originally, I don't think it has the same connections. I haven't quite figured out how they connect in a way that they're the same. So I don't know if I can really say exactly what my old ones were, but we'll see. So my old ones were accept responsibility, genuinely repent, express regret, make restitution, and request forgiveness. Oh, so the only thing that the two major differences between... The one you took. And then this one is just plan change is now, which I wonder, do you think plan change was genuinely repentant? Yeah. So I feel like those actually do maybe kind of. So those were the old ones. Now my current ranking of them are planned change, accept responsibility, make restitution, express regret and request forgiveness, which ranks in that sense of low lift for me versus high lift for me, perception wise. So for me, planned change is an accepting responsibility on your end, which are more valuable to me in an apology. Whereas you expressing regret and requesting forgiveness feel like they're high lift on my end. Like now 
the pressure's on me to somehow be responsible for your guilt. Yeah, and your feelings. You messed up. Not me. Like while I was reading the questions, I was thinking that in my head. I was like, because I do value as a you know, like as a person who as you know, you're getting want apologies and things like that. I value you thinking about what you did and then now like doing like saying how you're going to change. So I, I felt the same way. Like as I was reading, I was like, no, because this one was like even the way that the questions are worded, right? How it's like, oh, I wish that you would forgive me. Like, that's it. Okay, so I'm going to forgive you and then you're going to continue doing the same thing? like To do the behavior. Like, what? No, at this point, it doesn't make any sense. If we're not actually making any categorical changes, if we're not actually reflecting, repenting, doing the work with the apology, at this point, you're just talking. Mine was plan change was number one. And then the next three were all 20%. So they're like still pretty high, I guess. And it was expressing regret, accept responsibility, make restitution. And then my last one as well was request forgiveness. Like that feels to me like on Bloom's taxonomy, that's the bottom. That's literally what kids <laughs> do in grade school when they're learning exactly. to apologize. Will you forgive me? No. <laughs> and you know, like, I feel like as, as children, like, had you learned? No, I need accountability from you. <laughs> Like, I can forgive you all day, every day, but unless you're going to change something about that, like, why, you know? I definitely enjoy teaching kids how to also feel confident in not accepting an apology because I've definitely seen kids that are just like, I'm sorry for hitting you in the face. I won't do it again. Tomorrow, recess, hits them in the face again. I'm sorry for hitting you in the face. I won't do it again. You just hit them in the face two days in a row. It's definitely caused some kids who are kind of like frequently upsetting others to have to sit in some uncomfortable feelings because I've definitely had to mediate times where they're like, oh, I'm sorry that I did this thing to you. And I just, I put it out frankly. I'm like, okay, cool. I just want you to know that like, I'm glad that you apologized and took responsibility, but this person does not have to accept your apology. They don't have to feel better about what you did to them because ultimately like it's, it's okay for them to go through their process. And so you don't get to feel, because I've definitely had people that felt upset because they're just like, well, I apologize. And that should be the end of it. It's just like, no, you caused damage to this person. They are upset. I'm glad that you apologize, but they are in no way, shape or form responsible for accepting your apology. That's up to them. And if part of it is there are conditions such as I don't want you to do it again. And then I can begin to reestablish that trust and relationship with you. That's something that you are responsible for. You created that damage to begin with. And so you don't get to be upset now because people are like, no, I'm not about that life. And I think that's such an important skill to have as a kid, though, right? Because a lot of things that we do as children translates into the way that we'll act as an, as adults. So if you are somebody who's just like, oh, I'm just going to accept it. Like, I'm going to let you apologize and I'm just going to accept that. What does that translate to in future relationships, right? And I don't want to say that, like, what you do in second grade informs how you're going to be as a 28-year-old. But... If that is the way that we're normalizing apologies, right? And we're normalizing forgiveness. There's so many things that you'll forgive before you realize how unhealthy it is. But I remember that that's what I was taught in grade school. You just, the other person was made to apologize. You accepted their apology and that was the end of it. Exactly. Because it was so normalized, right? So even though I was feeling in the moment, like, oh, I don't want to forgive this person. Like, no, they wronged me. I was never allowed the space as the, I was say, as the wrongy. <laughs> As the person, you know, as the person who was like harmed to not to be able to sit in my feelings, I had to be the bigger person, right? Or like we're taught to be the bigger person and it doesn't put any, it doesn't put any responsibility back on the person who did the wrong. Literally, like you hit me in the face. Oh no, I don't want to see you right now. I don't want to be your friend. I don't want to play games with you. There, We're not all, things are not all hunky dory. <laughs> no, I would like for you to go away for a while so that in a few days, three to four weeks, mm -hmm. maybe six to eight months, I will forgive you. Yeah. <laughs> and then we can move on. And then we can move on because I've gone through my process and I realize that you are not a bad person. You just do bad things. <laughs> 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 just kidding. But you know, I think it's like, and it is uncomfortable for a kid. And even as an adult, like after you've done something wrong, like, you know, having to sit in that, like, yeah, you did actually wrong someone and you hurt them. So how are you going to move forward? And if that person on the other end, right, doesn't want to continue the relationship, that's also a reality that you like have to come to terms with. You did the wrong. So 
you are not essentially in control of that situation anymore. Which I think is the, it always reminds me of the intent versus impact and the fine line and the balance that you always have to navigate there. Because I think there is power on both sides. And so I can understand sometimes there are apologies that are a bit heavier to navigate because of the fact that someone could genuinely not have intended for something to be negative or misconstrued or hurtful. But that impact is different because we don't always know other people's perspectives. And so I think sometimes those are the things that I'm like, ooh, I still have a hard time navigating that as an adult. Same. I do as well. Oh, I didn't mean to make you feel like an idiot. It just happened. You just are an idiot. Just kidding. (laughs) Like, yeah. This is a terrible, terrible example. Exactly. But no, I've definitely had moments where I just like, no, actually, I was not intending to belittle your feelings in this moment. I, I thought that I was just communicating clearly. And I realized that my communication style does not always jive or it does not always match with your communication style. And so essentially, I've just insulted you deeply and did not even mean to not bat an eye about it. Intended. I did not intend to. But I feel like sometimes people manipulate that to the other all the way to like the other side of it. Because I think that's sometimes that's where I feel like cancel culture starts to come in. Oh, definitely. That sense of like. You've impacted me so deeply that... Oh, it was just a joke. Or like, you've unpacked this like deeply rooted trauma that I've had forever, which again, not to belittle anyone's trauma that they've had in their life. But I think it is also, yes, we are responsible for our impact. But I think as the person impacted, sometimes it does help to do a little bit of digging and research on what the intent was as well. Ooh, you about to get canceled for just that little nugget right there. (laughs) Well, because communication is a two-way street. It's not just on you because you got angry or upset at a situation. It is, again, if it's a conversation, if it's an interaction, if it's you bought tickets to go to a comedy show, part of it is like doing the research in terms of what this person's background is. How are you going to go to a person who notoriously makes certain types of jokes? And then you, that person that shows up to the comedy show, mad. Yeah. Or go, and like, at the end of the day, that comedian does not care about you. They got their coin, right? Do you have a personal relationship with this person? Have you told them specific, like, are you in spaces with this person to know, to now hold them accountable? Or are they like a public figure who, who owes nothing to you? I think at the end of the day, that's it, right? Like, what do they owe to you <laughs> to? Or like the consideration of like, I'm a naturally sarcastic person. And so, yes, I will say things sarcastically. and. I can understand how sometimes that impact does not always land very well. But in a communication style, it's a two-way thing. So understanding that like, it's not, the impetus is not solely all with me to alter my communication style to be received by you. It's partially two-way. So part of it is you understanding my delivery style so that you understand what my intended impact is, what my intent is behind the messaging so it's it's mutual it's complicated it's hard to teach it's hard to navigate and i will say some of these things i didn't even come into like realization about until an adult much less now trying to explain that to other people and little people at that who have no control over their emotions right they're little people with big emotions and people expect them to act like adults but they're children (laughs) i will say i'd be expecting adults to act like adults exactly and then sometimes I have to remember intent versus impact. You know, some of these people have not had these conversations with themselves or with their partners or with anyone. And so having that patience is, oh boy, it's a challenge. It's a struggle. Speaking of adults who have tantrums, like the reason why adults have tantrums is because we were never taught to work through a tantrum. So what you just said, like it kind of resonated with me of like adults having to act like adults, but like As children, right, when you throw a tantrum, most times, and I know specifically in my own instances, it was like, stop acting like that, you know, rather than trying to understand what are these huge emotions that you're feeling to make you act out like this. And then it translates into adulthood when you have adults who like, don't know how to regulate their emotions, or the only time that they've ever been, you know, like when they're when they're acting in that moment, it's always been like, stop doing that, rather than let's get to the root of the problem. Now as children, right, like, it's probably something very minuscule. But if you're not taught these skills, when you get to adulthood and you're acting out, you're like, 
I do have these big feelings. Now, where do I put them? <laughs> How do I work through them? No, nah, I've definitely had that as an adult for sure. And it's ultimately on that individual to do the work behind it. Because yes, like explaining your intent versus impact can only go so far before people are like, no, I don't mess with you. Because again, if I apologize all day long, eventually people are going to be like, no, no, actually, no, thank you. I don't, I no longer want to be a part of this energy. I no longer want this feeling in my life. I'm protecting my peace. <laughs> you got to respect that. Exactly. And so it's definitely something that I have been working on. And yes, speaking of the other profiles they have, the anger profile, it's not as, it's not the same five category test that you would take for the love languages and the apology languages, but it has like a nice little like red light, green light. Mm. Cause I wonder like, can you categorize anger like that? Like anger is such a wide spectrum of emotion, which I think you could say about love as well. But in this case, like, can you imagine like you took the anger test? So you experience anger as number one, tantrums, number two, just kidding. <laughs> you know what? Um, so where did you rank on that one? So when I took it in 2019, I got, you're doing well, but can improve. And when I took it on oh, this time, I got, you're doing well, but can improve. Oh, same. Yeah, I was the same thing. So I'm still doing well, but can definitely still improve. When I was younger, my anger was so like, I was such a, like, my mouth was so fast. And I was very quick, you know, now as an adult, and I think now as a teacher, right, I can't, I can't just get mad at a 12 year old for running their mouth. Like they're 12, you know, so like, who am I to be getting into an argument with them? But also like, you know, really understanding that anger is a spectrum and there's times when you should react and then there's times when you should. And they they even write in that little, like after you take the test, they have like, there's times when there's good anger and there's bad anger. Did you see that? I did not. At the bottom? Yeah. So I was talking about how like good anger is placed it like what's considered good anger is like towards injustice and like things that have wronged you versus like bad anger is acting acting with an intent to harm you know like i'm angry in this moment so i'm going to hurt you in the way that i know how to hurt you either you know physically mentally like emotionally whatever that means and so like that's that's categorized as bad anger but like seeking a sense of injustice and like you know real life very big issues that's like considered a good anger according to the test because there's just times where like you just have to you should be feeling some big emotions mm -hmm. we you're gonna have big emotions in your life i know anger is one of the stages of grief it just you're gonna have big emotions in your life so i think it is kind of nice to know the difference between i guess productive anger versus reductive anger good versus bad anger am i out here going through this because it's it's real and you know someone just someone has died and part of me is just resolving the anger with the world with the universe with god with whoever or is it just like you cut me off in traffic so now i'm a honk at you for 30 seconds and then tailgate and then do things that are do things that are dangerous yeah no nah, i definitely understand like there's a difference big feelings and like okay Sir, you've been maybe minorly inconvenienced in traffic today. Heaven forbid we forgot to put the whipped cream on your coffee today at Starbucks. I asked for a star in my design and what did I get? A squiggle. Your Yelp review is going to is going to reflect this. <laughs> What's your name again? Barista number? Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad you were able to take these other two languages. I just think it's just one of those things like, yes, A... I love a good personality test. Facts. I think the apology language was one of those things that I realized about myself, but didn't always have the vocabulary to say. I didn't like when people were like, will you please forgive me? No, I won't. Because you gave me the option and the answer is no. Yeah. That's how I approach the apologies that I give to people as well. It's like, dang, that did not work out for you or for me, but I'd like for it to work out in the future. So how do we make this work out better? I agree. Overall, any final thoughts about what you learned about yourself as it relates to love, apologies, or anger? No, I think if anything, it just like validated what I feel. So I was like, okay, I think this is how I like, I didn't even actually know what the apology languages were, like in terms of what the categories were. So I had no idea really what it was going into it, which we had talked about beforehand, like, oh, like, I wish I could take this test unbiased again, you know, because definitely for the love language, I knew right? I knew what it was going to be. I knew the five languages. But for the apology one, I was like, actually, no, like, 
I have no idea what it's going to be. So I'm really going into this and, you know, being really honest with it. I feel like it's one of the more practical personality type assessments I've found, as opposed to like the colors, your numerology, those four acronym things that people will be talking, Myers-Briggs or whoever. <laughs> it's one of the more practical, like, I feel like I've used these in my daily life more so than any of the other things. And able to communicate it as well, right? Like, I can tell you that when I need an apology, like, this is how I would prefer for it to happen. And like, the reason why I give apologies the way I give it is because that's how I like to receive my apologies as well. Exactly. So I really liked it. It was very helpful. But I agree. With that, it is now time for our rapid fire question. My question for you today is, what is your favorite soup? <laughs> Tomato basil bisque. Ooh, with, with a grilled, grilled cheese? cheese? Or mac and cheese. What? Tomato bisque with mac and cheese. Mm -hmm. You just dip the noodle in the soup. You put the noodle in the soup. <laughs> it, it's very similar to, because like, I guess the only real difference is that the bread doesn't absorb, but yeah. it's still it's very similar. Um, my favorite soup. Oh, I have so many. Soup is like one of my favorite courses, TBH. Um, if there's a clam chowder, I'm going to eat it. If it's in a bread bowl, even better. Uh, solid though is the Olive Garden Zuppa Toscana with the unlimited breadsticks though. That's where it's at. <laughs> That's the one with the sausage in it, ain't it? Yeah, the sausage and the kale and the potatoes. Mm -hmm. You're very hearty. Yeah. Classic soup. Yes. I've never, definitely. It's one of those things that like I almost wish I could make soup. I don't know how to make soup. It's probably mm. not hard, but like it seems kind of like it takes a long time. I think it's also because it's one of those things that you can easily like make flavorless. <laughs> mm. Or over salted. Yeah, if you don't do it well enough. Like, and it's like, it is one of those fine, like, it really is at the end of the day, a liquid that you're trying to either make flavorful. What is your question for today? Do you prefer. <laughs> when do you prefer? When you prefer? <laughs> do you prefer to wear shoes or go barefoot? Oh, barefoot. All day, every day. I think that's why my feet are so big. I have. I've come to the conclusion that that's why my feet are so big. No, like I, in a house, definitely barefoot. On the beach, barefoot. Um, I think shoes are restricting. They don't want me to live my best life. So yeah, barefoot. Oh I feel like God. your shoes, huh? I wear shoes. I think it's a sensory yeah. thing. Though. Like <laughs> inside, I wear socks, but like I don't wear shoes inside. But like I wear socks. I just I don't know something about just bare feet all over the world. Don't make ugh, it's just gross. When I'm on the beach, I wear those really high. Sandals, because I hate so the you sand. don't have to feel the sand. So I don't have to feel the sand. I'm dead. And then when I'm literally anywhere else, I'm in shoes. Yeah, if I had an option to go barefoot and like the world was clean, I'd do it. I think yeah, that would make sense. I think one of the only places that I wasn't going barefoot for a really long time were like natural springs mm. and stuff. And then you know I was just out here wilding. When you're younger, you're like <laughs> whatever. I realized they're very slippery, so I found that like water shoes are actually really helpful because they kind of help with the yeah. So you're not slipping bit. and sliding and breaking your back. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. at this point, you know, you just take that one, that one wrong twist, and Ooh, there goes your kneecap. It's out. It's out. Yep. You are done for the rest of your life. <laughs> I definitely am like, no, no, give me them water shoes so I can grip on these little slimy rocks Ooh. a little bit better. <laughs> It'd be like that. Emma, where can people find the podcast? You can find our podcast on Instagram and Twitter at The Tea with Crema. You can also newly find us on Facebook at The Tea with Crema. If you'd like to leave us a tip or just send us a cup of coffee or tea, you can memo us at The Tea with Crema. You can also stream our podcast anywhere that you stream your podcasts as well as YouTube. We hope to see you next time. Bye! Bye.